Recognized, Uncle Walker, D, 0, 1. Recognized, VJ, Brown, D, 3, 9. Hello team. Today in the Watchtower, we bring you VJ Brown. VJ is the editor, producer, and storyteller of the podcast Hedged In, A Changeling Story. In addition to being an active intersectional feminist and a part-time unicorn, which I've witnessed myself recently, VJ is also a freelance graphic designer working in print production and layout. But her early career started in media production, specifically cinematography, which we will be talking about very soon. VJ, welcome to Whelmed. Thank you, Rich. I'm really glad to be here. Before we begin, I want to remind everyone that our discussion episodes draw on anything and everything related to Young Justice, including both seasons of the series so far, the comics, and the video game. If you've not seen, read, or played all of the material and are spoiler wary, please consider this your warning. Uh, and with all that out of the way, let's dive in. So, VJ, I touched on a couple things in the intro, but tell us a little more about who you are and what you do in the world. Uh, alrighty. Um, hi, my name is VJ, and uh, like Rich said before, I am the storyteller for Hedged in a Changeling Story, which is probably the biggest uh, media footprint that I have on the internet right now. Um, but I've existed on the internet uh, since forever. I'm sort of OG fandom for uh, Young Justice, where I was a, an original watcher during the original run. Um, and really got into a lot of the different meta pieces of Young Justice. So uh, that was going to be my next question: is when you watch the show, and it was all in the original run. That's fantastic. Yeah, no, I was I was really into it at the time um, because uh, when I uh, looking up at, at the next question of what was my history with DC, like I was a very big fan of the original series and Justice League Unlimited. And then when they announced Jelling Justice, I was really, really into that. I've been into a lot of the DC animated universes, um, not so much the comic books themselves, um, yeah. but like the Cartoon Network and, uh, and you know, WB animated stuff has always been something really close because uh, I kind of like, like my young in days, I grew up on uh, Batman Beyond. And so, nice. you know, I just, I, I kind of love it. Yeah, Batman Beyond, man. My my wife used to watch that. She said while she was doing her like homework and stuff. And I I just I, when it first got announced, I was like, "What are they doing with this?" And then I saw it and it was incredible. What a great series that was. Such so good. So good. So like good. And and I think the the idea that that you know, you get you get there's a lot of people I talk to who well, you know, a lot of people I talk to. There's a lot of people I talk to. Also, we did a survey uh, where about 75% of the people that we surveyed who are fans of Young Justice had never read a comic before watching the show. And 25% of those people didn't even watch like live action or animated stuff before that. So it's not like they watched Arrow and then decided to watch the show. Not that Arrow was even out, but like there was a bunch of other stuff going on at the time. And so that's so fascinating to me that the show has such a wide reach to a general audience that, you know, people were sitting down and watching it with whoever was watching it at the time and really got into it. And and you didn't need to be that's just it. You don't you don't need to know anything about the comics to jump into Young Justice. No, in fact, like in in from what I understand, they do things slightly differently. So it's it's kind of like when you watch any adaptation from a book to a movie where they're like they're going to change things um but i think that's just one of the powers of the young justice storyline is that you can you can watch and get into it and be like oh no it's it's really dynamic characters it's like it really hits on uh the intrinsic themes like it like it is one of those shows that since it has strong storytelling from beginning to end, especially in that first season, like they know where they're going. They can tie in all of these different thematic elements and create a comprehensive storytelling structure that doesn't require a lot of homework. Um, right. Well, not like like I think one of the best things is that they make Robin very like very approachable because like a, there is a cultural zetgeist of of batman and robin um mm -hmm. but in this in this place you can kind of like play with robin some and that mm -hmm. goes with calder and and kid flash where like all of these characters have histories in the comic books and also connections to their superhero counterparts but the show does a really good job of 
not completely tying them to their to their hero um, mm-hmm. and making the sidekicks really accessible to a newer generation. Um, yeah, and what's really interesting to me too on that same vein that you're talking about is that they applied the characters to the story that they were telling, but with the exception of Calder, who's like a brand new character that they created for the show, there was an Aqualad in the original Teen Titans, and he's the character of Garth that we see later on. With the exception of Calder, none of these characters are like some kind of crazy hot take. You know, there's not like a hot take on Robin or, or this Wally West is going to be totally edgy and different or whatever. It's like, no, it's it's the Wally from the comics. It's just that, no, he and Artemis never met in the comics. Artemis is way older than him, if I remember correctly, in the comics anyway, and has like is married to Icicle Jr. And like there's weird stuff going on in the comics, right? Mm-hmm. But like you can still have the heart of those characters, right? You don't need hot takes on – I mean, even their Lex Luthor is – Classic Lex Luthor just turned up to 11. Lex is doing nothing wrong. Lex is just giving people what they want. I haven't done anything wrong. (laughs) Right? And that's the horrifying part of Lex Luthor. It's not, again, some hot take where he's like some crazy, insane megalomaniac or, I don't know, the Facebook founder. I don't know. (laughs) It's like this very strange thing that they do with him sometimes i'm like can we just get actually lex luther on the page oh look there he is in young justice so and and being able to do that and make it approachable like you said for a whole new generation of people and not even a new generation just a new generation of of dc comics fans no matter what their age was is, is super impressive yeah like uh like in in that vein like uh, on top of being a fan of of jail uh justice league justice league unlimited batman beyond i was a big teen titans fan when that was coming out and that's sort of again one of those like long form storytelling systems where or or short form long season uh where you can really build up the emotional tension of something and young justice was a really nice like i i enjoy teen titans go but it's just a it's it's thematically for a different audience right um, yeah where exactly. where young justice kind of has like all of those really nice story pieces where it's like oh i can see what they're doing there oh here's what they're foreshadowing here right exactly exactly so spinning from that a little bit you and i just officially met uh at least in meet space <laughs> a few <laughs> weeks ago in at gen con yeah. Uh, which is a the huge where San Diego Comic Con is the enormous comic convention uh, for media in in comics and and other things geeky media. Gen Con is like the same basic size of number of people and, and attendees, but it's entirely focused on tabletop board games and role playing games. And that's how we first met. Actually, our, our mutual friend Aaron was going to come, but he ended up getting a, a killer job somewhere that he had to go fly to the far reaches of the world. <laughs> um, and so he dropped you in our lap. He was like, please take care of VJ. We're like, okay, we got this. <laughs> Aaron is a good bean. He is a good bean. Yeah. Aaron is the co-host along with our own uh, professor, Jeff Stormer, uh, of the uh, All My Fantasy Children podcast. Aaron, uh, Aaron Katano Sias is fantastic. He's wonderful. How was your Gen Con? How was it for you? That was your first one, right? Yeah, it was my first Gen Con. Uh, it was it was amazing like i cannot wait to come back next year it was such an experience to see all of the different kinds of dis- of of like industry and people playing and just different styles of play like the the convention center was huge like i've, I've been to anime <laughs> conventions right. before like i've right. been to like otakon i think has been my biggest one but even then like otakon like I haven't been there for a while. Um, so it was it was one of those things that I definitely got my steps in. Right. But <laughs> I think one of the best parts of Gen Con and that it's it's not as different from like anime or like other like media conventions is that uh, especially in the tabletop space, you're still dealing with story. You're still dealing with themes and and motifs that are going to repeat on themselves. Um, and those themes and motifs, if you are sort of consciously thinking about them, give your role play experience a more grounded feeling. Um, yeah. Because if you can, if you can sort of, because in essence, being a storyteller or being a dungeon master or a game master is very similar to being the camera in a television show because how you frame the shot can emotionally impact your players. Um, and in the AP space, 
the actual play podcast space, like that's, that's taken that step further because, you know, uh, you're not only playing to the, the audience that is the players at the table or the players in front of your computer screen, but also the listeners. So you can, you can sort of do, you can lampshade things, which is actually one of the notes I have about some of the, uh, some of the cinematography in this, in this episode that we're going to talk about. Yeah. Yeah. Well, let's get into that a little bit. So when we were talking about having you on the show, you know, there was a few different things that we were discussing, but the thing that fascinated me was your incredible excitement about that and about the, this thing that we haven't really talked about on Whelms much at all. We've talked, we've alluded to it a little bit, but none of us have had any level of expertise. And that is the idea of cinematography and animation. We talk about character development. We talk about facial expressions. We talk about things that you have to plant ahead of time, particularly in a show like Young Justice, where episode one is foreshadowing the finale in the first five minutes. You know, like you have to set these things up. Uh, as Crispin Freeman said, set things up to knock them down, right? Uh-huh. But we haven't really talked as much about some of the cinematography aspects. I think Morgan Jenkins talked a little bit about one of the scenes in season two where Tula had died and she was in, she's a hologram, hologram in the grotto. And every scene where they're discussing Aqualad, she's there. Like they change the camera angle so that Tula's kind of in your field of vision, you know, reminding you, oh, this is potentially why why he turned to Black Manta, right? Uh-huh. We talked about, and that's I think that's it. Out of forty six episodes, I think that's the one we've talked about the most, where cinematography was clearly, you know, used in a in a particular scene. So let's talk about a little bit about like I think I, I feel like I have an emotional understanding of what cinematography is, but I there's got to be a more like specific technical like description. So can you start with exactly what that means, particularly in animation versus live action, maybe? Um, okay. So cinematography is so if we break it down to its constituent parts, it's photography, like photography, the act of taking a picture. Cinematography is the act of taking moving pictures. Right. We can break that down into into things like shot composition, where okay. how how people are placed in front of a camera, because again, this isn't a stage. Okay. You're you have a you have a visual camera, which means that you can both cut things out of view and add things in view. Um and so where a character stands in relation to other characters and how the camera plays into that adds emotional depth. So in do you want me to use any of the examples that I have? Yeah, well, we had we had wanted to, to – when I asked you, is there a particular episode that you think was a good one to kind of look at and break down, I, I was actually a little bit surprised, but you had said cold-hearted. And uh, for those who don't remember, cold-hearted uh, was an episode about Kid Flash on his 16th birthday where all the rest of the team got to team up with the Justice League to take down these, you know, five – devices, cold generating devices that were creating a blizzard across the United States while the Flash, while Kid Flash had to run a heart uh, from uh, New York to, where did he have to go? San Seattle. Francisco to Boston? Seattle. 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 New it York was, to Seattle, yeah. something like that. Uh, Boston to Seattle. Boston written, to Seattle. I have it written down. And he had to run across the United States because no, no air traffic could go and blah, blah, blah. So he went all the way across the United States um, to help save uh, this little girl's life who ended up being Count Vertigo's niece. Who is the queen of the yeah. country that I'm right. not going to attempt to measure. I, I, I can't get Markovia out of my head now because it's the it's the country that's going to be center of focus on season three and I'm it's driving me crazy. It's like that land it's like there's a lot of V's in it. <laughs> oh yeah. I I we'll we'll figure it out. So that's basically what happened. And so there is a lot of scenes in a lot of different places and a lot of different directions, but why why this particular? Like maybe we can fold this into like you said your examples and this definition of cinematography. Like why did why was this one out of 46 episodes one that jumped out at you? So this is an episode where it is it is it's a really character driven episode as as we might have mentioned before so because it's it really focuses on wally and in that it allows us to when studying cinematography it's really easy to get bamboozled with like oh shot composition colors and everything else when there's a lot of characters on screen so when you have an episode like this where it's really focused on one character you can really pare back the the scope and really look at individual shots as they're going on and how the how the the unseen narrator is telling you this story 
and it, it allows you to really emotionally focus at on one character at a time. That's that's interesting. Can I jump in for a second? There was mm-hmm. something that somebody said, and I can't remember who it was. It might have, I'm guessing it was like the cinematographer for like Lord of the Rings or something. And I, I was just watching something, and they were saying they said something to the effect of, "If you can, if you can see my work, if you notice my work, I haven't done my job right." Like you were just used the phrase "unseen narrator," right? So this yeah. idea, of someone is you, everything should just feel like it flows correctly. And like a novelist says basically the same thing. It's like, if you read my novel and it seems like this novel, like it was so easy and everything happened the way it was, it should have happened. And I just sat down and wrote this story, you know, then you're wrong. And I, I did my job right, but you're wrong because I blood, sweat and tears went into this thing and it was hard to make it look like nothing, like it was easy. And I, I feel like cinematography is kind of that same thing. It's hard to make it look like it's easy. Oh, yeah. Like uh, cinematography, ballet, graphic design. It's it's one of those things of it's incredibly, of course, I, I, I say this. Uh, I, I like to usually say it's not usually difficult. It's usually tedious. But then people give me a, a look of, no, that's actually really hard. Um, right, but right. It's the, it's the act of. It's an act. It's a balancing act of it is difficult, but when it's done correctly, it should look seamless and perfect and graceful and be balanced. And I really I love discussing cinematography in this way because I think it is a really solid way to actually do media analysis because, you know, when you're reading a book, it'll it'll talk about colors and it'll it'll talk about themes but when you're viewing it on a screen it cuts down some of the distracting <laughs> distracting interpretation i have i have a lot of add personally so when when i was always trying to write about books it was it was very hard even though i'm a pretty good reader um but versus when it's like oh i can look at this very visual medium and go oh they're setting up this shot and because this lighting, it, like they're playing with these colors, they're doing this shot, like the camera is telling you things, but you're not actually aware of it unless you're specifically taking detailed notes about like, oh, okay, you know, this shot is, since since we're looking up versus down, it's going to create a different dissonance um, right. of, and feel. Right. In relationship between, see, I always think of everything in character. Mm-hmm. So where the character is placed, that that resonates with me. And I can see what's going on in the background. You know, like the thing, one of the things I reference all the time, Artemis's apartment in downtime where they have the, you know, Hello Megan TV show is about ready to play in the background on the, t- on the television. Mm-hmm. And she turns it off, you know, 20 episodes or whatever, eight, whatever it is, 18 episodes before they do the big reveal. Mm-hmm. Um of 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 McGann, but I'm looking at like okay, how where is she sitting and how is she sitting and why is this camera way up in the corner of the apartment, which has never happened in the other shots that we've had with her? Oh, you need to see the TV. Oh, now I've watched it a lot, so now I get why it was there and what was happening. Mm-hmm. But most of the time, I'm perceiving something. I'm looking at something. It's more about the character than it is about the stuff in the background, mm-hmm. and. I guess I kind of see that, but like constructing it is strange. I can I can talk all day about breaking down a character and its development and arc, but which is funny because uh, since since this is animation, since this is based in comics, it's it, I mean it, again, this is more coming at it from the the process of art rather than the art itself. Like to take two steps back, I was having a conversation with someone about like. Oh, you know, like getting paid to do art. And I was like, well, no, I I get paid to do design. And they're like, well, what's the difference? I'm like, well, art is expression. Design is the pro is, is breaking down that process of expression. Um, so when you're designing and when you're, when you're making a composition, what I'm looking at is, is, what is the what is this camera angle? What is this this composition telling me about their how they designed their process? Like you know what sort of animation tricks they're using, or what sort of like uh, material components are they are they using for the actual creation on the on the cell on the cells, uh, right. as well as the what are the subtle emotional things that they're sort of pushing underneath that character growth? Yeah. To to 
to actually reference on Artemis, I actually do have uh, a note about. Yeah, I would love to hear some examples of this. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm, I have like I'm four or five pages. Um, so during the during the birthday scene, uh, so like uh, we've we've already we've, we've actually already passed like some establishment shots with some with some foreshadowing, but we can. The birthday scene is where Wally's there with Jay Garrick and uh, Jay's wife, whose name just went right out of my head. Um, his parents and Barry and Iris, like everybody's at the house. Is that that the birthday scene you mean? Uh, no, I was actually talking about uh, skipping all the way up to the Mount Justice scene, w- uh, which one of my other favorite parts of the episode is the uh, repetition of 16 in the in the numbers. Uh, in, right, like, yeah. Uh, so at this point, it's the J- Mount Justice uh, sixteen oh five Eastern Standard Time, or you know four oh five non military time. But right, you know, right. they have to they have to add that in. There's this shot with our uh, with Wally sort of hinting at uh, McGann being like, "Hey, I'm the birthday boy, and I would like a kiss." Oh right, <laughs> right, right, right. I, I know what you're talking about now. I forgot that that happened first. Right. Yeah, and there's this. Beautiful set of shots that really that helps foreshadow Artemis and Wally as endgame. And so at this point, Wally is still sort of has feelings for McGann, but the camera work is going to tell us that the audience tell the audience something that the characters don't know. Okay. Which is Artemis's feelings for Kid Flash and how they're more than, you know, more than just friendly. Mm -hmm. So. We see this over the shoulder shot uh, where we see over the over Artemis's left shoulder. So Artemis frames out the yeah, the right hand side of the frame. So we know that we're looking we're looking at Kid Flash and McGann from uh, Artemis's point of view. And so we and but the art, but the shot is also tilted down. So we see over but down Artemis's shot. So we can see that Artemis is feeling outside of this, you know, connective bubble because uh, okay. versus because if they had lifted the shot up where they had made McGann and Kid Flash even with her eyeline, that would have established the concept of, oh, she feels like a part of this conversation. But at this point, it's like, no, it's pointed down. She's feeling she's feeling elevated and away. Basically, whenever a camera angle is pointed, whenever we, the audience, are looking down at a scene, huh. we are supposed yeah. to feel that little bit of alienness, which is, you know, mentioning the, oh, they've never done this thing where, you know, you see all of the apartment, you know, that's also to create this, this dissonance of like, you're watching from above uh, right. and you're not connected. Interesting. I'm thinking about other scenes because that's a pretty, huh. It's a pretty common thing that gets used. Yeah. But I mean, yeah, I'm like, you're, so you have a character, I don't know, Superman or whatever. Mm-hmm. And there's that that kind of common trope where he's floating above the town, looking mm-hmm. down, like I'm here, but I'm not a part of you right now. And that that's like an obvious extreme example. But you're like zooming it down into like the almost very subtle, just angles of things in that scene. But it echoes the same feeling and idea. Mm-hmm. And then and then they and then they uh, they continue it where like so Wally and Megan uh, McGann interact. And then Artemis turns to face the camera, but she's not like looking directly at the camera because that's that's actually, you know, bad camera work. So she's looking sort of past it. But the camera, the camera focuses its it changes focus. So it, it goes from looking past Artemis to Artemis. So we're supposed to right. have that 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 moment of, oh, this action right here. Uh, affected Artemis, and now we're seeing Artemis's reaction where she's unhappy about it, but she has turned her back to Kid Flash and McGann, indicating that this is not something that they realize, just the audience. So right. this is this is an example of show, don't tell. We're showing Artemis's feelings about this. We're not going like, Artemis isn't casually walking over to another character going, Oh, I'm really into kid flash and I don't know how to deal with my emotions where the, we can, we can tell that she's a little bit jealous of this interaction, but is also feeling disconnected from this interaction through that shot. 
So like we can we can make all of these meta criticisms and go, oh, this is what the and so we can kind of tell, oh, she's really into him. So we can kind of get that foreshadowing aspect of we mm-hmm. can tell that like Artemis is connected to the team because through uh, um, Wally's um, that that emotional connection. Right. Can I I, I want to ask you about something else that may not have been what you had intended to talk about, but you had said something about like she didn't turn and look directly at the camera because that's bad camera work. And so I'm thinking about, okay, what would that look like? Oh God. Yeah. That strikes me as really weird. If she's like looking at the camera straight out at me, it almost, it's, it's the implication of automatic. The only time that ever happens is when someone's breaking that fourth wall of reality and recognizing you as a person who's watching. So like Deadpool or, you know, some other random movies from like the eighties and nineties tried yeah, this like trick Ferris as well. Bueller. Yeah. 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 Ferris Bueller. Right. Yeah. Yeah. At the beginning where he's literally talking to the camera and he's talking to you. Mm-hmm. Why is that though? So when you are, when you are taught camera work, like sort of the very, the very basics, um, there's really two, two distinct styles of camera work. There's usually the journalistic style versus the fiction, like, or like the cinema. I wouldn't say cinematography, but like versus movie style. Uh, okay. So when you're a journalist, you want to look directly at the camera or um, often that's a little disconcerting for folks. So when you're first starting, they usually have like a little ping pong ball with a smiley face sitting on top of the camera. So you're actually looking right over the camera. Right, um, right, right. So when you're looking directly at a camera, the idea is is that you are looking directly into their face. They are, you are making eye contact with that person. Mm-hmm. When that happens in in fictional media, that actually breaks continuity. It breaks that fourth wall. And what happens is the it breaks immersion. So if okay. the character is dir- talking directly to you, the audience. It's usually done on purpose because it's like, hey, we're we're breaking that fourth wall, literally the the wall that is separating the actor from the stage, which is where that term comes from. Because like, there's three walls on a stage. Oh, the fourth wall what? is the wall between the I stage and the audience. I actually never knew where that term came from. Yeah. Oh, it all makes more sense now. Yeah. Okay, I get it. I get it. I get it. When when a character quote unquote breaks the fourth wall, they're talking directly to the audience. Now, if if they're doing that and not on purpose, it, it becomes less immersive. You can't, you can't close the, your, your thinking door, like the, the, oh, well, you know, there's this plot hole, um, unless you have like the infinite power of pause and going, Hey, wait a minute. This seems like a plot hole to me. Um, so when, so you don't, you don't generally have characters directly look at a camera. They're usually looking because also they're usually not talking to the camera. They should be talking to a character, to another character. Right. Right. But I can see like, like if I was a kid Mm -hmm. back in my day with an old, you know, like handheld camera or a camcorder or something that I would have, my instinct would be like, Oh, you're talking to a character. You should look at the, you should look at the camera because you're talking to a character and then we'll just cut back and forth between the characters and you're talking to like that would, I mean, once you do it a couple times, you'd probably realize how terrible that is, but I could totally see that that might be the first instinct and it really, you shouldn't be, I can see why you shouldn't be doing that at all. Well, it's just, it. it's not, it, it's not the end of the world, honestly, but it is, it is going to feel less genuine. Well, unless you're doing it on purpose, like yeah. if you're doing it on purpose for a reason, whatever that reason happens to be, you just need to know, you need to, well, the yeah. mentor from college used to tell me, you need to know the rules to break the rules. Mm-hmm. And then once you break the rules, after you've proven you've known the rules, then you're a genius. But if you just break the rules to start off with, people just think you're just being ridiculous like learn the rules first then break them then you're a genius yeah yeah um because like we can actually like flipping all the way to the, the 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 very end of the episode where like there's the moment where kid flash is looking at the queen you could kind of go well aren't they looking at the camera then and then i'm like well sort of um when you look at the queen's animation so which which scene is the one where she's in the bed and she's confronting Count Vertigo? Is that what you mean? 
It's actually it's actually at, right after that, like where she is giving the sword to Kid Flash. Oh, right. And she's like, you know, take this as a reward or a souvenir. And uh, you see this. You basically have you have her eyes at the at the top right thirds. So like she's looking at, her face is basically directly at the camera, but her eyes are looking up. So the camera is looking directly at her, which oh, means that we are supposed to emotionally connect with her because she is yeah. connected to us. But she is looking up at Kid Flash in a both a literal and a metaphorical sense of she's looking up at Kid Flash, but she also right. looks up to Kid Flash. Right, right. That makes sense. Where, and then, like, when we see Kid Flash, it, it cuts down, and we, like, it's that same two-thirds where, like, they're, they both have, like, the really bright green eyes, and he's like, this is why I'm doing the things I'm doing. Like, it's that emotional payoff of the episode. Mm -hmm. Um, and and it's really really set up well with that cinematography of like of of blocking out those pieces. Yeah. What about so those were two emotional emotional moments of two different kinds of emotional moments. What about other scenes that are I mean we we talked about there's one where he just he's he's exhausted, he's tired, he's hungry. He's running, he goes through the alleyway and there's all these like banners for like food companies and he's, you know, just wants a chicken. <laughs> easy. And then, you know, and then there's, he, he runs by or sees or is confronting, distracted by Vandal Savage. Like there's some action scenes there too. There isn't a ton of it in this episode, but there's some and do, I'm, I'm assuming the same kind of idea gets put into when you're choreographing like the choreography and the cinematography have to work mm -hmm. together. Oh yeah. Right? So like, uh, well, let's, let's tackle the, 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 that scene with the food. Cause we've already in the episode, we've already had, um, we've already had this recurrent theme of, of Wally and eating, which is, you know, not surprising cause it's kid flash. He runs a lot. He burns a lot of calories. Um, you'll get used to seeing Wally eat. <laughs> So it, basically the camera pans down the street of Chicago and like we see Kid Flash run out into the distance um, and then pan up to those food, those posters. So the posters are also in a lot of those bright yellows and bright reds. So we're supposed to visually associate those foods with Kid Flash because those are the, also the colors in his costume. Um, so like it, it really helps pop a lot of those a lot of those things also as we pan up we see in the background more flashes of lightning and that lightning is supposed to that one shot which is actually a pretty clever way to expand uh some animation time because it's a really it's a it's a slow pan up on a on a on a uh, single frame of artwork um which means that there's mm. not a lot of things to animate right um so when we pan up and we look past and we see the the you know the the lightning, it's a foreshadowing that goes, oh, he actually probably does need to eat. He needs to have that food, and it foreshadows him like collapsing at the hospital later because he's out of energy. Right. So uh, there's a darkness to that. It's not like because if he had been doing that and it was all sunny, not outside of the fact it'd be weird for the episode's plot, but. If he had said the same thing and it was sunny and bright outside or there was a nice long shot, it would be more like, oh, that's cute. Yeah. And not like, oh, this could potentially go really badly. Right. Um, and and uh, it's it's one of those things where uh, it's a very it's a very subtle shot. Um, but they do that actually a couple of times where they like or I mean, it's a pretty common tool in an animator's tool belt to do like really broad what are called um establishment shots or oh, right. um or, uh, where they establish a sense of place before zooming in on a person uh, and in the animation world it's a lot easier to paint a very big set cell and like pan over it um mm -hmm. than have a whole lot of like moving pieces ah yes yeah, so the, so the so it could be like if they weren't going to have him like collapse at the end of the episode, you could just pan it back up and it would just be dark. Like it would just be the dark and the snow because that's already the established, 
you know, oh, one of yeah. the established problems. But because they add that, like, that crackle of electricity, they've already used that a couple of times to, 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 like, be a visual, be like, hey, this is an important foreshadowing moment. Um, like, whenever you see those, those flashes of lightning, which is, you know, kind of also one of kid flashes and the flashes motifs oh, you know yeah. like those are visual motifs that are if you're not pay- if you're not looking for them you will actually still notice them because you'll have that sense of foreboding um but you might not know why you're having that sense of foreboding it's like oh this is this is important because he hasn't gotten to eat he's gonna this is gonna be a problem for him later mm-hmm. um Versus fighting Vandal Savage. So, um, like, so there's, there's this, there's basically two mirrored scenes. Uh, one earlier in the episode where Wally is basically like whining because he's a teenager. Um, he's like, wait a minute, I don't get to get to fight with the league. And there's this, there's this, this sense of, disconnect with the rest of the team um because they're always in they're never in the shot with kid flash or if they are they are fuzzed out in the background and you see this like big image of batman and he's like oh i like it's 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 supposed to play on his his feelings of disconnect uh and feeling like he's ma- being made less important um but it's also supposed to play on the fact of no we're supposed to be kind of like Wally what are you doing here dude like you need to you need to grow up because you know again it's playing with the theme of he's turned 16 he's he's um he's made a cultural he's 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 going through a sort of like a manhood ritual, basically, where right, he's yeah. he's taking on an extra burden. So we have that shot earlier. We have it paired again when he's, you know, duking it out with Vandal Savage, um, especially when we 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 see a lot of his, you know, a lot of like tight shots where it's just his face reacting to things. And we're hearing his emotional like sort of what's going on in his head. Um, so we're we're seeing that repeat where he's still not getting why his job is important. Um, action in and of itself uh, can be ha- have strong cinema uh, cinema bleh, cinematic. Um, hold on, let me let me save your editor some work. Action can have some cinematic qualities that make it particularly important but usually it's just the the you know making sure that everything looks dynamic um it's usually those moments in between where uh there's that pause in the action and like the characters are having a dialogue or having a dialogue with themselves that are you know more important because you're you're seeing you know not just the action but why are they doing that action is is the important part right well, what what other examples do you have on there? You said you got a page or two in notes there. I, I do. Um, let's see. We have we have the opening the opening shot of like him actually waking up in the morning. Um, and I also have some detailed notes on when he uh, when he finds out the 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 quote unquote bad news. Um, I can go through either or both, whatever you prefer. You're you're guiding me on this trip. <laughs> okay. Um, well, let's let's go all the way back to the beginning since we've bounced around this episode. Yeah, um, yeah. There's an establishment shot. Like we we see Wally, we see the piles of food for the birthday boy, and basically there's this there's this last shot right before we hit the title card, where um, we see the outside of Wally's house, and we'll see the outside of Wally's house a couple of times this episode. Um, but a car drives pass in front of Wally's house and slides a little bit and then gets back on track. And it's this really tightly defined uh, frame where it's, a, it's a lot more closer. It's a lot more intimate. Um, and then the camera will pan up to the, uh, the, the camera will stay in frame. Yeah. Okay. 
yeah, sorry, I'm rereading my notes. Um, so it's really, really tight and really intimate and direct. And this is this is a foreshadowing of this is a this is this story is a p- character driven plot, and it's specifically based on Wally. But then the the camera will pan up to show the snow castle, the snow fortress, um, and the di- the dynamic is ch- changes the the feeling where it's like this quiet but small issue where you know the car drives by and it right. shifts it's like that's a small issue kind of foreshadowing the hey you know he's going to have to move from one place to another and there's going to be a small bump in the way but the car is going to keep going uh, versus like this really big and menacing but it doesn't it doesn't have much of an emotional connection other than it's big and menacing and then you know lightning strikes and we white out the screen we go to the title card so like it's like maybe five seconds but that establishment shot foreshadows the rest of the episode of it's about wally it's about wally doing something having a little bit of a skid and then but continuing forward oh interesting okay yeah uh like so <laughs> if rebecca sugar has taught me anything it's that you know every every cell is drawn so uh, who Re- is that, uh, Rebecca that Sugar is the creator of of uh, Steven Universe, and so it's it's one of those things of uh, especially in animation, every cell is drawn by hand at some point. Like there's there's been at uh, you know you still you do stuff on computers, but every single cell is is handled at one point. Um, so ev- no shot should be wasted no no movement should be wasted um so each each little piece is like a clue in the in the grand game particularly with a show like adventure time or or steven universe where the episodes are generally like 11 minutes long or something right oh yeah with those are so tightly compact that like they can't waste time on filler they just they can't um and and that's to its benefit where like the the smaller the more compact it is usually the more concise a story it's going to tell i'm i'm more familiar with adventure time than steven universe but I, just like that opening scene the this the camera flying shot of adventure time where you're like oh here's this magical children's world or whatever and you're like is that a pile of like garbage over there like what is that and then <laughs> it just keeps going and like oh i guess there's vampires and there's this okay okay and you're <laughs> just kind of like rolling with it until you realize like this is serious spoilers for Adventure Time. This whole world is a post-apocalyptic nightmare is what it is. You think it's some kind of rainbow unicorn happy place that uh, of a child's imagination and you find out later on, um, no, it's tearing my heart out and stomping on it a whole lot. And <laughs> when you say he's Finn the human, it's because he's it. He's the last one. Like, what is happening right now? But all that stuff gets a stat, gets like... It's stuff in the background. They just like, we're telling a story and we're putting some things in the background. And you can wonder what those are until we tell you, but we're, we're doing something else right now. Oh yeah. No, like that's, that's anim- animation is just wonderful for that, especially in the, in the longer form, you know, uh, storytelling and stuff that has a cohesive storyline where, you know, uh, like young justice, like Steven universe, like Voltron, um, because they have a story to tell and it's not just sort of LOL random, which, you know, has its place. Um, each thing that they do, uh, is telling you there's something about the story or something about the character or how you are supposed to react to that character. Um, a, a, a common thing in metacriticism that you can use to sort of figure out themes is okay if you take a character and you see their actions you can tell a lot about what the author feels about that character by how they are rewarded in the end of the story um so a a bad guy character is going to have their just comeuppance at the end of uh, uh, at the end of a story um so but like you can also you can also 
tell that they're going to have that come up. It's usually by either how they how they're dressed or, you know, there's all of these visual cues. But um, <laughs> that's that's a whole different <laughs> that's a whole different kettle of worms. Honestly, <laughs> I could talk about that a lot. <laughs> yeah. Well, can you. So one of the things that I want to touch on here before we wrap up too much is. And we kind of touched on this a little bit, I guess, but this idea of uh, the difference between cinematography for a live action movie and the one that just jumps into my head again, for some reason, is Lord of the Rings because it's just filmed in New Zealand and it's gorgeous there. I mean, it right? won like thousands of Oscars. Yeah, it's just a, one of the greatest visual masterpieces of our generation. <laughs> right. uh, yeah, no, that's that's cool. So you're looking at that. And then you're looking at an animation piece where you're not like looking at it and going like, okay, well, we should film this mountain range that already exists from this angle, you know, with this lighting and do this to the film afterwards. Like you're creating this literally from scratch. And I mean, maybe you're in, being inspired by a building or inspired by something like the Hall of Justice and Super Friends was inspired by whatever that building was. I think it's in Chicago or Boston. But I mean, like it's inspired by something, but that's not, I mean, all this stuff has to be created. And in a way that can be can be put into an animated form. So, like, when Phil Barassa and the character design team design a character, they have to design it in a way that it can actually be animated and look good. Like, a single shot of anything is can be whatever you want it to be. But if you've got to get it to move around like it's real, you've got to think about that. And I'm thinking about the same thing with these cinematogra- with the cinematography. Like... How do you set up the inside of the watchtower? And, you know, like the, the watchtower, for example, I didn't know until, until we were doing this show that the watchtower wasn't built by Bruce Wayne like it is in every other incarnation of Justice League. The watchtower was an abandoned Green Lantern core outpost that had been dragged into orbit. And so there are a bunch of shots that you have. First, that's why it looks so weird. It looks like it's built on an asteroid or something. But like there are over a lot of over the head shots, like you're talking about looking down at the team and stuff. And there's this stylized Green Lantern like symbol on the floor that I never even noticed. But I was like, oh, this is kind of cool. They're like looking down. You can see all the characters and that kind of stuff. No, there were other things in the scene that I didn't even pick up on. Oh, definitely. What, oh, what, do you, what do you see as like, is there a difference between the cinematography of a live action thing? It seems like a dumb question now that's coming out of my mouth, but uh, no between the questions. live action cinematography and, and animation cinematography? They play off of each other. With anima- animation and film have always been connected. They they learn from each other. Um, I think there was a post I retweeted um, that was the, you know, one of the the author was like one of my favorite images is the shout out to a, the the motorcycle slide from Akira um yeah like and how that is that is done over and over and over and over and over again because today it is a it is a a, a visual shout out to Akira in specific but we actually also see animated influences on film media as well the matrix is is often uh, often credited by being directly inspired by Ghost in a Shell. Um, so when you you can't really go, one doesn't influence the, the other. Right. They build and they trade. They trade influences. So you can use a lot of the knowledge of a live action cinematography to analyze a animated cinematography. But you also need to realize the the drawbacks to both of these mediums. Um, when you're dealing with a live action cinematography, there's a whole lot of extra expense to create special effects, right? Um, yeah, yeah. Because you have to then go through and recolor or have the computer recolor things and and design those special effects, um, which is something that animation doesn't have to deal with because we're already we're already drawing everything, you know, might as well might as well do it. Uh versus in animation, doing something like a long walking shot, um, which is, is something that you see in things like West Wing or uh oh, right, yeah. Or, you know, whenever whenever you have like two characters walking down a hallway talking to each other, you're right. you're really not gonna have that in in animation because that's a that's that's a lot of body movement that is not doing that is not action. It's just, you know, 
you huh. know, filling in those spaces. So you're not really going to see that in animation versus when you're going to see that in film. That's funny. It was flashing back to, we had Jason Spizak, the voice of Kid Flash, since we're talking about Cold Hearted on the show. <laughs> and um, he's a very animated speaker. And I was talking to him about that and how it might affect his acting or that kind of stuff. And he said he was kind of, he was he had to be trained to stop doing that when he was trained in classic acting because they called it wasted movements. Like it's not, it's not movement that's informing character in some way. It's just kind of getting people's attention, I guess, in real life, like, or whatever it is we do, why we talk with our hands, you know, <laughs> but this wasted movement idea, never even thought about like that. That makes perfect sense to me. Why would you do that in an animated, why would you do that to yourself in an animated piece when you can do something else? <laughs> right. It's like, uh, but when it is done, when it is done in an animated piece, it means something. It you Like, right. So again, it's that whole, you know, when you are breaking the rules just to start, you know, you just, you don't know what you're doing versus when you break the rules after you know the rules, you right. know, when, when they're having, when they're sort of making extra work for themselves when they don't need to, the camera is t like the production and the camera is telling you something, um, right. whether you are actually cognitively aware of that is, you know, 50, 50, right. But it's still going to have an emotional impact on you, whether you know it or not. And that's the yeah. sort of the beauty of design is that it, you you might not know, but you are still affected by. <laughs> right. Exactly. Exactly. Uh, that's fantastic. Uh, this has been really interesting to me. And uh, <laughs> you defined fourth wall for me. Why did I not know that already? Well, because it's, 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 it's kind of an it's kind of an obscure reference if you if you haven't done if you theater. if you're not in theater, right? Yeah, I mean, I'm sure Emily's probably laughing at me right now because she's she's like, really, you didn't know that, Rich? Seriously? <laughs> well, thanks so much for spending some time with us uh, here in the Watchtower. I almost said the cave. The cave got blown up a long time ago. Uh, thanks so much <laughs> for spending time with us in the Watchtower, BJ. Where can we find you here on Earth Prime if people want to chat with you more about what you do? Uh, you can find me pretty much anywhere on the internet as NW Ferry. Um, specifically, Twitter is is where I'm 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 currently the most at. Um, you can also find my work at uh, www.hedgedinacs.com for the podcast Hedged in a Changeling Story. Uh, the Twitter handle is also Hedged in ACS, and uh, you can find my design work at vjbrowndesigns.com. Perfect. We'll have links to all that in the show notes. Thanks to everyone else for sharing some time with us. You can find us on Twitter at the YJ Files, on Facebook at Crashing the Mode, on the yjfiles.tumblr.com, and on our website, crashingthemode.com. You can also get a hold of us through our email address at whelmedpodcast at gmail.com. And you can also find us on YouTube, Stitcher, iHeartRadio, and we're working on some more tracking things down to be on. If you enjoy our show, please consider sharing it with a friend. You can also support the show by giving us a five-star review on Apple Podcasts or your podcatcher of choice. The ratings help others find the show. If you do leave us a review, please let us know, especially if you're outside the United States. We have to look a little harder to find those. And even though season three is on its way very soon, please continue to spread the word to friends and family about the series. Buy YJ Comics on Comixology and get yourself up to speed for the season three premiere. And as always... Stay whelmed, everybody. You've been listening to Whelmed, the Young Justice Files podcast. Our hosts are Rich Howard and Emily Booza. Our editor and producer is Neil Powell. Our theme was composed by Emily Mio. Our logo was created by Kevin Bates. Whelmed is a fan-made podcast and is not officially affiliated with DC Comics, DC Entertainment, Warner Brothers Animation, and any other owners of Young Justice or its related source material. As such, these companies have sole ownership of all symbols, images, names, logos, and proprietary material related to Young Justice. Original content of this podcast is ours under Creative Commons. Thanks for listening, and stay whelmed. 